Okay, thank you so much, Tanya. And hi, everybody. I'm so appreciative that you've all made this time uh, today uh, to join me for a little bit of um, experimentation here with painting the passion of dance. I do want to take this opportunity uh, to thank uh, Karel and in particular Tanya for organizing this webinar and uh, for all the hard work um, that uh, Tanya's done over the years and the, uh, all her colleagues at Corel have done to create this uh, and continue to develop this amazing tool that we have as artists. And uh, I, every day, uh, you know, I have to say I'm just so absolutely thrilled and amazed at uh, what we're able to do, you know, uh, with the digital paint. So with, with no further ado, uh, I'm going to start off uh, with a little bit of, uh, in, you know, inspiration, talk a bit about the work that I've done, and then I'm going to use the, the last half of this webinar to do a live painting from scratch and just share some of uh, my approach, techniques, and philosophy. So let's dive in here um, with what I think is one of the, um, for me, one of the most inspirational, powerful paintings of dance, and John Singer Sargent's El Haleo. Uh, from 1882, um, and if you haven't had a chance to go to the Isabel Gardner Museum in Boston uh, to see this uh, live, you sh you know I really recommend that you do. It's an enormous painting, and they presented it there in this uh, sort of Alhambra feeling, uh, incredible building. Um, and when you you stand before this painting, boy, you feel the passion of flamenco you feel the atmosphere uh, and can just imagine the, the clapping and the, the sounds um, that night you know as this dancing was happening and the interaction between the dancer um, and the musicians um, the, the passion of everybody involved in that moment and so you know for me this sort of summarizes in a, in a sense what I am for when I'm painting dance it's not just painting the, the forms of the dances. It's not just painting a scene. It's not just capturing a composition that shows dances in a context. It, for me, it's much more than that. And as a dancer myself, um, you know, dance is about being in the moment. It's about letting go of everything uh, and not thinking. It's not a following of patterns and things you've learned by rote and rules. It's about absolutely giving yourself up to the moment of that uh, process of being there with the music, if you're dancing with a partner, with your partner, um, if you're responding to musicians, it's that relationship. So that is what I want to communicate in painting the passion of dance. Of course, another great artist who's renowned for his dance artwork is Edgar Degas. And uh, we see here some, just a few of his beautiful studies of dancers many times uh, when they were sort of um, in rehearsal and practicing in, in the rehearsal rooms at the back of the uh, Palace Opera. And uh, it's just wonderful the way he captures that atmosphere um, and uses sort of uh, wonderful compositions, which for his time were actually quite revolutionary um, and quite influenced by photography, actually, very interesting. But you see here the use of those wonderful little accents in the bows, the reds, the greens, the yellows. You see here his use of the mirror reflecting the outside. Uh, and uh, as is typical with Degas, the way he has elements uh, and people and subjects sort of somewhat cut off at the edges of his compositions. Renoir, of course, did um, also beautiful atmospheric images. And this one, um, a, a lovely uh, painting, which I'm sure you'll all be familiar with, of uh, the couple uh, dancing in the countryside. Uh, and again, great use of sort of uh, complementary colors there with the orange against the blues. And uh, this is uh, John Nieto, and um, this is uh, an image of a fancy dancer, Native American dance. And uh, I just, uh, well, last year in October, um, had the pleasure of being in Santa Fe. I was teaching actually a workshop named with the same name as this webinar, Painting the Passion of dance, although it was flamenco dance we were painting. But um, I love the uh, boldness and the color, very influenced by Matisse, the Fauvis uh, palette of John Nieto. And also what I love about his approach here, if you look carefully at this 
painting. First of all, we have this abstract background, which is very reminiscent of Matisse, if uh, anyone's familiar with the Femo Chapeau. Um, he did these, he basically Matisse did wonderful, colorful abstract backgrounds and then painted things on them. Um, but then what I really enjoy about this uh, use of media here with John Yeddo is that he's got this essential line drawing superimposed over these wonderful luscious backgrounds. So anyway, just the sort of thing that uh, I find very inspiring. Um, this is going back uh, uh, a few years for me, but this is a, a painting I did of swing dancers in the middle of doing uh, sort of improvisational lindy hop. But you'll see here I've also uh, use an approach where I have sort of very rough uh, abstract backgrounds and then work with some line work over the top. Um, this is flamenco jam and this is actually um, Virginia Inglesias, uh, a local performer uh, here in San Francisco and uh, this was based on uh, a dance uh, she did uh, locally. Um, and what you'll see here is I'm using um, lines to really shape the passage of energy through the air and uh, as some of you will recognize modern art in a can as a major contributor to some of those energy lines. This was the title slide shot. I call it Swing Out and this is really the essence of Lindy Hop. Lindy Hop is the dance I most love. I do many dances but that's my absolute passion and the essence of Lindy Hop it revolves around the swing out and the swing out, if you uh, ever get to see it, and you can just Google Lindy Hop on the web, you'll see it, um, involves, it's basically, a, as a, my ex-physicist comes out here, two-body problem, um, it involves two people sort of swinging around in an ellipse um, and using each other's counterbalance to do so. And you see here in this painting how I uh, really endeavored to capture, even though it's you know a frozen moment, I've endeavored to capture the spirit of Lindy Hop with the movement in this ellipse and the counterbalance and the tension between these two. Um, so that's really the, you know, what I wanted to communicate in this painting. I've also done it very abstractly. There's no details anywhere. It's very, very rough. And again, uh, some of you, uh, I know there's a lot of really, really experienced um, painter artists here uh, joining us today. And you'll recognize um, Sargent with quite a lot of jitter. Uh, in quite a lot of this. This is mostly actually Sargent with a lot of jitter. Um, this is Moment in Time. Again, a captured moment in a tango dance. Um, and tango, a beautiful dance, uh, all about passion and about the relationship and about two people becoming one. And so that's, again, what I wanted to capture here. Very, very simple. Um, so based on um, a fairly grainy photo I took in very low light conditions. These are two friends of mine, Christy Cody and Darren Lees. Um, again, tango, similar sort of feel. And this is uh, James and Mariana dancing uh, locally in the metronome ballroom, impassioned. And again, just a, a passing moment in the dance, but one which has such a stillness. And that's one of the things that's so beautiful with tango, is it's, it's a dance where they're there's a, a sort of quietness and stillness to those moments of connectivity. And I had to share this one with you. Um, a few years ago, I had open studios here at my um, studio in San Francisco. And um, an older couple walked in. I had tango music on playing in the background. And they just started dancing. So I you know, asked if I could take some photos. And I took a whole bunch of photos of them. And it was one of those dances where you see the couple and you could just see right away they've been dancing for, you know, oh, for, you know, decades and decades and decades. They just were like so comfortable and just moved as one. And um, later on I did this painting. I tried to contact them. Um, wasn't able to. I, um, and then years later I was exhibiting this painting and um, I managed to f uh, contact the lady. She, you know, left a contact uh, information and in the end I did manage to contact her and it, I call this endless dance and it turned out that this was their last dance. He was sadly um, at the end of an illness and passed away soon after. So I'm going to move um, here to actually um, some, uh, uh, something quite recent. This was in fact last week. Uh, I had a painter creativity workshop here in San Francisco and 
the theme was inspired by Degas, and uh, we worked with the local academy of ballet. And in fact, we're going to do another one in April 29th to May 4th. So if anyone's interested, uh, come on by. We, we'll go to the same academy. It's really fun. But what you see here is just, I was talking to the dancers, um, and I'm holding, you can't tell, but I'm holding a book called Degas and the Dance. So talking to them and showing them some of the um, uh, ways that Degas captured dancers. And um, this is just a, a quick sketch um, that I did based on one of the photos from that shoot. And this just shows uh, the uh, sh uh, photo shoot in action with one, one of my students. And I don't know who that guy is on the left there with the camera. Uh, but anyway, uh, getting in the way there in the mirror. And um, this is uh, uh, one of the dancers, uh, Mona. And just did a little quick um, demo sketch. Most of what I'm showing you here were quick demos, uh, paintings that I did actually as part of the class. So they're not fully developed. They're really more studies and sketches. And it still, still needs work, but you'll see uh, basically, you know, play and experiment all the time. Um, this was uh, the workshop I mentioned in Santa Fe, um, at the Santa Fe Photographic Workshops. And what you see, the location, ah, oh, amazing place, the Scottish Rite Temple, based on the Alhambra. And if you ever go to Santa Fe, this is a place worth visiting. And um, you see here that uh, I, I went from a photo to complete abstraction. Um, and, you know, part of the essence of, for me, painting the passion of dance is getting away from just the detail, the contour, uh, and really diving in more at a visceral level uh, and a, a, in a way a more base energy of the scene. And so that's what I do with paint. Uh, and what some of you may have you know, heard in the past, I describe as mock-up or the initial underpainting. That abstraction, which you see here, done in just a few seconds, um, is actually capturing a sort of underlying essence of the scene. And then I sort of bring back more detail with uh, whatever brushes I choose to use. And uh, this is uh, Juan and uh, Emmy. And again, you'll see here um, complete abstraction. I just really look at the broad blocks of light and dark. So if you half close your eyes here, that what you basically have is uh, almost as if you were looking through an incredibly diffuse glass at just the blocks of light and dark. And then I start bringing things back, and in this case, playing a lot with texture. I love texture in Painter. And um, it is one of the most amazingly powerful features in Painter. And um, I remember all those years ago when I first came across texture in Painter, and then I thought, hey, I hmm, wonder what if I just make up my own uh, sort of textures and start playing with them. And it's like, wow, you know, um, and it has never stopped since, really. You can do so much. And I always integrate relevant textures. So just going back to that one, um, those textures in the background are all from that building. Um, so I sort of weave in this sort of story in texture as well. Um, this is a, a flamenco uh, fiesta, I call it. And this is actually... Um, uh, a wonderful group of dancers and musicians who were performing at um, El Farol, uh, which again, uh, if you go to Santa Fe, go to El Farol. It's the absolute uh, classic, one of the oldest bars in town, and it has flamenco performances Friday, Saturdays. You have to book ahead, so uh, worth doing. But anyway, that brings us to the end of that little uh, introductory slideshow. Um, I did also just want to show you here um, the uh, dance rehearsal. Some of you have seen that. So this was a painting, uh, actually, uh, with a lot of the dancers from that same Academy of Ballet. You'll notice the costuming, actually. Um, and I created this painting based on the principles of uh, Degas' composition, um, although it's actually a complete mix. I've got the Academy of Ballet windows on the left and the De Young Museum windows at the back there, because this was actually part of a performance. And you see me here working on it. Um, at the De Young Museum. Um, and here, the same uh, uh, thing. I was being a tableau vivant dressed up. Yeah, that is me, dressed up as Degas and working also at the Legion of Honor. Um, and you'll see here me uh, that I'm doing Conte sketches on paper as well. 
and um, translating this sort of simple uh, line drawing approach to painter uh, sometimes as well. So these are all actually non-digital, they're just Conte crayons um, on paper. So let's dive into painter and have some fun. So I have a couple of images um, that I'm going to uh, take a look at. And so this, uh, this one that we see here is um, an attic uh, painting. So uh, well, it's an attic photograph going to become a painting. This is actually the uh, really, really dirty, uh, dusty attic of the Scottish Rite Temple in Santa Fe. And uh, we got the dancers up there, and it was just amazing light. So I'm going to do a little painting with that. But I think what I'll do is to start with is um, just do a little sketch based on this, just uh, give you some thoughts and ideas. Uh, so we'll do two different things, sketchy, number one, and then painterly, number two. Um, so this is uh, Emmy in San Francisco performing um, uh, a, few, a couple of months back. And so uh, my basic approach, no matter what I'm doing, whether I'm going to do a sketchy thing or a painterly thing, is I always like to work uh, in a way that's rather parallel to traditional painting. That is, I like to have a visual reference in the top left. And so it's just as if I'm uh, pasting um, uh, a photograph next to my canvas. And that's essentially what I do. And in this case, um, even though there's a lot of darks and everything, I'm actually just going to uh, take this image, the ME01, and I'm going to do a quick clone. And uh, that basically is a shortcut for a number of different uh, operations all in one. So quick clone uh, makes a duplicate, sets up a clone relationship with the source image. And in my case, I've set this to, um, uh, to delete the image so it clears the paper to white and then turn on tracing paper. Um, I'm using um, my, work, my latest workspace here, which actually, uh, this workspace, um, which you haven't seen yet because I haven't untabbed the palace. Oh my gosh, look at the palace. <laughs> okay, let's do that again. One, two, three. There we go. Okay, a bit overwhelming, I know. Don't worry. Uh, we'll get things simplified. But um, just so that you know where we're at. Um, I'm using a workspace that I actually just loaded onto Paintbox TV at about midnight last night, um, and it's the Jeremy P12 Workspace 5B. So the sort of thing that I do in my workspace, besides have all these um, custom palettes, you'll see here custom shortcuts and all these groups of, um, of brushes that, you know, arranged in a way that sort of, for me, works in my process of paint. But then also I, in my preferences, um, let's see, preferences, quick clone, um, you'll see here what I've set quick clone to clear the canvas, turn on tracing paper, okay dogs. Um, so I'm going to turn off tracing paper, uh, just so that you can see we really do just have a white piece of paper. And then I'm going to make use of this wonderful thing here. So uh, in Painter 12, we have this great clone source panel. And in the clone source panel, we have an amazing slider. If you're going to do anything with tracing paper, you can even use it to turn tracing paper on and off. You don't even have to use a shortcut. You can just slide it on and off like this. What this is doing is controlling the tracing paper opacity relative to the opacity that you see of whatever's on the destination image. Um, so the advantage is you can make it so that you just get enough information for reference but you can still see what you're doing. And um, by doing that, I can just, let's see, go to my Pensley um, choices here. And I'm just going to have a look here and click on the Real 6B Soft Pencil. This is a fabulous pencil. Um, and I'm just going to pick some colors here and maybe we work around. And I like to change things up a lot as I paint. So whether I'm drawing or painting, what you're going to notice is um, that I'm actually changing a lot of things. So in this case, I'm actually just changing the color um, of my pencil stroke. One thing that's really nice about this, um, I'm just going to turn the tracing paper on and off so you can see. One of the things that's really nice about this 
real six B soft pen tool that I love is that um, acting rather similar to a um, a lead pen tool with say a long lead that you can um, work on the side. Um, if I have an area of my drawing that I want to fill in. So say I want to some shadow down here. So let's go to a sort of uh, mid, slightly lower the mid-tone uh, for some shadow. And what I'm going to do is now take this pencil, uh, take the stylus rather, right onto its side. And uh, especially if I make this a little bit bigger, um, let me just have a look here. And then we'll just very gently work on the side of the stylus. What you can't see is that I'm actually working um, with the stylus on the Wacom tablet tilted at quite a steep angle. And that's what then gives this soft broad um, effect. And then just by tilting it up to a perpendicular angle relative to the um, relative to the tablet surface, I can suddenly get my fine line back. So I can go back and forward uh, between fine line and not. And just spend a couple more minutes on this. What's nice about working uh, with this and for a sketchy approach is um, it's quick, it's easy, um, it's fun, and you can really mix in different techniques with this. So let's just turn this off, uh, tracing paper off, see where we're at. And I'm just going to do... Um, I'm just going to do an uh, iterative save here. Um, typically, when I'm working on projects, um, I do uh, save as is all the way through, as anybody who's started with me uh, knows very well. But um, just for the sake of uh, the demonstration, I'm going to do an iterative save. And we'll just call this uh, ME001 and just save this as a riff. And then I'm going to get a, a nice big chalky, uh, let's say a large chalk, and maybe work with a different texture here. So go to the paper panels, uh, papers library, um, when I'm working with a tool, you know, I just want to be aware of what texture I've got. Do I, you know, is there a, an interesting texture that might fit in here? What about this Gatsby lace? Um, ah, that might be fun. And, you know, a bit of artistic license here. I'd, one thing uh, to know is that I don't worry so much about literalism in terms of I've got a photo. Oh, my gosh, I have to make my painting look like the photo. Um, not at all. I like to play around the edges and you know, use a little bit of uh, artistic license. Um, I think I've got a uh, various different um, options here for parquet floors. So let's have a look. Let's get a nice something that will be fun for a floor. And maybe this wood grain, zoom out. And just do a little bit, maybe a bit warmer color there. Another nice thing about paper grain is you can just continually change it because it's not it's not really a property 
of the actual um, file itself. So it's essentially a, a repeating tile that acts as a filter. And so it allows you, um, so I'm just doing a little bit of clone color here. And I'm going to look at some glazes, uh, broad water brush, make it a bit bigger. Whoa. Zoom out. Go to the other side with a little bit of shadow. So what I just did was use a um, little bit of um, digital, wa digital watercolor. And normally this digital watercolor is um, actually, it's in a layer, it doesn't show up in the layers list. And you'll find that if you want to move things around, like for instance, uh, if I go now to, um, let, let's pick a uh, artist palette knife from Jeremy Box at seven, this is the new brushes that are in um, the latest workspace. Um, what you'll find is you can't, you know, I'm not affecting the digital watercolor until I go to the layers dry digital watercolor. So anytime you have these weird effects like, oh, what's happening? I can't seem to affect something. Um, you want to check out whether it's a digital watercolor and now I can affect it. So now I can uh, work with, say, uh, a palette knife on here and um, just finish this off with, um, Let's have a look here what we've got. We've got Runny, we've got Sable Chisel, Took Water, Oz Palette Knife, Flemish Rub, and Diffuser 2. Diffuser 2 is from the tinting uh, category, and I love it. If you're going to do anything that's going to be printed out on paper rather than canvas, and you want a really uh, watery edge to something, you can hardly do better than this Diffuser 2. Again, that's in the tinting category, one of the default categories in Painter, Diffuser 2. So I'm just going to do another uh, iterative save, and um, I'm going to move on from the sketch. Just wanted to share some ideas there. But let's now move on to something um, to finish off um, the last half hour here, and that is actually let's get into doing a painting. And this um, image uh, got lots to work with. But before we dive in and paint with this image, um, I'm going to uh, call in Tanya here. It's uh, halfway through the webinar, so um, good time if you, you know, we could take a few minutes here if you want to uh, just sort of read out uh, if there's any questions and, and I can address them and if they're, you know, concerning the earlier image, that's also fine. Sure. So um, there's always this question in every single webinar and people are wondering what tablet you're using and I actually uh -huh. wonder if you uh -huh. switch between different tablets depending on workflow? Um, I do actually, but right now I'll tell you exactly what I'm using. I'm sitting at a desk and I'm using an Intuos 5 Medium, which I love, um, and this is my sort of workhorse, and especially when I travel of course. Um, I'm actually working right now on a MacBook Pro and I'm looking though at a 30 inch Apple Cinema display. So I have my MacBook Pro um, attached to that display. I do love to work on a large display. I, um, now even though when I'm traveling I work on my you know, 17 inch laptop monitor, um, when I'm in my studio um, I have a Mac Pro as well and also with a 30 inch display. So I love that. And with that computer, I have the extra large Intuos 4, um, and I just enjoy the space, etc. But um, the, uh, the Intuos 5 is fabulous, and you'll see here, um, can you see the uh, Express view of the e Express keys? Yes, we can. So you'll, you can, okay. Yes. Because you'll see there, for instance, I have a, um, a very important shortcut that I program in for the temporal color, which I recommend every, if you know, everybody, if, even if they only program one express key, this is the one to program. Um, it's the shortcut for the temporal 
color palette because when you don't want to um, have all your um, palettes showing, oh, well, you know, you just do this, you, you know, paint, um, let's pick a brush here, something, let, let's go for the artist, sergeant. By the way, you'll notice that by having my little shortcuts here, I don't have to keep going up here, that saves me a bit of bother. And um, so here I can just uh, call up that temporal color palette and say, oh, I want to paint with, um, let's see, something in that sort of tone and put that mark there. Um, and then I want to get a sort of bit more of a darker color down here. So, you see, so it makes it really easy to paint on the fly like that. So anyway, that, that, that's the answer. Long-winded answer to that short question. Any okay. other questions? Uh, Very think? good. Yes, there's, um, we're wondering, can the brushes from your previous version training DVDs, let's say Painter 10, can they be installed in 12? Yeah, they can be, yes. Um, the, the, the best thing is to, um, just to, uh, if possible, just to upload my new um, workspace, which includes... Um, a, a, a much expanded set of brushes um, in this um, set called Jeremy Box Set 7. So this is actually all the ones that were in my earlier, or almost all the ones that were in my earlier brush sets, but plus, oh my gosh, I've just been, I've just been making more and more um, custom brushes. Um, so it's, it, these are over 160. By the way, if you ever see brush names or category names that look wrong, like Jeremy's, what's that, or uh, Real, what's that, um, there's a little tip here, and it, it took me a, a little while to work it out. I was like, oh, has something gone wrong with my brushes or the categories? Well, actually, all you have to do is pull this thing to the right. Ah, there they are. So just a little tip there. <laughs> Caught me out at first. But um, the answer to the question, though, if you have, uh, whether it's my brush or anybody's brush from uh, older versions of Painter or older DVDs or older websites, whatever it is, um, and there's great brushes out there, Skip Allen, David Gell, I mean, there's so many wonderful brushes. Then in Painter 12, they made it really easy. Um, so you just go brushes, import, and now what will happen is you have to know whether you're importing a variant, then you choose brush, or a category or a brush library. And most of the times it will be category, and then when you select category, um, you then can select the, um, the category file. The, the easiest thing nowadays is for someone to simply export whatever it is they want to share using the brushes export function and then share that file. Because then you can actually just double click on it and it opens in Painter. It makes it really easy. Otherwise, um, you have to import um, using uh, legacy imports. Um, but anyway, uh, again, bit of a, a long-winded uh, explanation there. Do you have anything to add to that, Tanya? I mean, from your own experience of bringing in brushes from earlier versions of Painter and other people's brushes, do you, do you have any tips? No, I, I think that's the way that you do it. We definitely need to put together a little quick tutorial mm. explaining that because that is yeah. the number one question that we get nowadays. Okay. Well, I tell you what. I'm gonna. I've got a few new tutorials I want to do on Paintbox TV, um, and I'll uh, include that. Um, I'll make a point to have one that talks about importing brushes and everything. Um, and actually, um, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, I do have a whole bunch of free videos. Um, so you don't have to. It's a subscription-based site, but I make sure there's a ton of stuff there that if you just want to go and browse and have a look and. I mean, everything I'm showing you here is just, you can just go and uh, access uh, for free. Uh, anybody can. So I make sure there's a lot of stuff there. And I've also, I'm introducing a new section here called Getting Started. So actually, that will be a good video to add um, to my Getting Started. I'm going to build up um, a sort of, you know, a sort of methodical way to get into Painter and to set things up, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway. Um, and actually, while we're here on the web, um, great brushes. This is uh, jitterbrush.com from David Gell. I love his brushes. And also, Skip uh, does amazing brushes and um, tutorials with, uh, of course, his great um, watercolor brushes. Um, 
and uh, I think we also have a Karen's Painter Talk here. So great, great uh, resources uh, to look at. And uh, the, incidentally, the, this is the uh, corel.com slash Jeremy Sutton page. Um, if you haven't updated your painter, um, I do have here, com for your convenience, um, the 12.1 uh, and the 12.2 update um, download buttons. So um, they actually, uh, well, uh, Tanya can, uh, can uh, help us here, but Corel just introduced, uh, I think a day ago, on the 15th, a couple of days ago, um, the newest update, which is a, a patch for Painter 12, which makes it very, very memory efficient. And uh, I actually experimented with it and uh, had a huge collage um, that I did for a wedding, and it, it worked fine. It went quickly. So I do recommend uh, updating. Um, if you're not sure how to, just go Corel Painter 12, check for updates on a Mac, or it would be help check for updates on a PC. Um, Tanya, anything else? Well, I think I'll hold off for now because I'd like to give you the opportunity to um, finish your painting. And anything that we don't address in the webinar, we'll be sure to follow up with. So don't worry. So what you're seeing me do is, uh, again, a repeat of the same thing you saw before. So I make my small, big arrangement and adjust things. And I take the time to do this. Um, you know, one of the things is that, um, actually I'm going to put my finger here. You can't tell, but I just shrunk that down using the touch ring on the Wacom Intuos 5 medium tablet. I find it very useful for continuous rather than the command pl or control plus or minus, which is uh, jumps are a little bit too much for me. And now I'm going to go to clone. Ah, different, different uh, to before. Because I'm going to do a painting, I want to get into some just to sort of more nitty-gritty, painterly stuff. Um, I don't do the quick clone. So quick clone for me, it's brilliant if you're going to end up painting something against white, print it on beautiful watercolor or fine art paper. Quick clone is great. But for anything else, I like to have the image uh, up uh, as a clone copy. And let's just... Uh, uh, pick a color from within it, option click or alt click on a PC. Um, let's turn on here and see what we've got. Maybe make it a bit darker. And I'm going to do edit fill, um, command or control F, fill with, <coughs> do we want to fill with hands and chicks? No, current color. Got to watch out for that stuff. And, um, you know, this is uh, my canvas, but it's a bit plain and uniform. That, of course, is the... Um, signature of anything digital, it, it's sort of like nature defaults to disorder and entropy, but digital defaults to uniformity uh, and identical things. So what I want to do is break up that uniformity a bit with some texture. So let's just go uh, have a look at a, something we can at least texturize that background. And now I'm probably going to cover it all up, but all the same, um, it would be really nice to have a texture there. now. Typically, I would work with a texture, say, from the um, Alhambra uh, shoot and have it consistent. In this case, I'm just going to find something that looks interesting, decaying wood. Mm. Well, let's just see what that uh, looks like. So, um, and we can introduce the texture into this plain canvas by a number of different means. Um, so, under surface control, we can emboss it, apply surface texture. Um, using the paper. Whoa, that's a bit shiny. Um, it does look rather interesting and nitty-gritty. Let's have a look. Yeah, you know what? That'll work. It's, it's a, and there's a uniformity to it because it's a pattern. It's a repeating pattern. But that's okay. I'm going to be, I'm going to work with that. At least it's just not plain. So we'll just do a save as to begin with here. And um, let me just create uh, a folder here. I'm just going to call it Attic and we'll just call this Attic-0, well it's actually going to be 0, 02 and we'll call this um, the uh, fill. Fill with texture. Don't worry about spelling. Save as a RIF because while you're painting in Painter, RIF is absolutely the safest format to save anything in. And um, then we're going to start off 
with some of these nice juicy brushes from the oily bristly dabby um, uh, shortcuts palette and, um, and I've created by the way custom icons um, you can do that really easily you just do a selection on a piece of an image um, any image that contains a bit of that brush say and then all you do is hold down the control uh, on a Mac or right click on a um, PC and you say capture custom icon so it's that easy to do um, that was one of the things that I love that was introduced in Painter 12 so let's go for something really really rough ooh Denzel funky chunky with a bit of extra color variability hmm what does that look like let's make it really big ooh yeah I like to get uh, things working big and rough uh, in the early stages of the painting and this is where that um, having that temporal color palette is absolutely essential now this is where I also would recommend and I'm dabbing here not just making big brush strokes I'm actually dabbing I'm looking to the left even though I know you can't see my eyes but they're darting to the left and I'm uh, actually doing observation based painting even though it might look a little bit random and what I do recommend here is that you use your own color and not clone color the temptation with painter is because it has these incredibly powerful features for working from photographic uh, reference that allow you to pick precisely the color in the photo there is a huge temptation to do that and um, for painting purposes I highly recommend that you resist the temptation um, because you're going to enliven your painting with colors that go way beyond what's in the photo if you use your own color and pick it as you go rather than um, use the color that is in the photo and once you start playing with color you'll and then you use clone color you'll realize uh, how much you've gone beyond the color in the photo and the photo starts the photo color starts to seem a bit dull even when it didn't seem dull in the first place but once once you've played with color in your image it's it starts to get real dull so you don't need tracing paper at this point this is rough and ready this is l loose and general um, this is big and bold so all these words that are about don't worry about detail and as soon as you start like trying to do a contour and all that stuff so uh, this is completely different to the sketchy thing I did with tracing paper before because you might say hey wait a minute you did that sketchy contour before and you had tracing paper on right away and all that stuff and you're absolutely right and I just wanted to share that technique with you but when I come to paint that would that would kill my painting if I started with that approach it would it would I wouldn't be able to produce a lively painting I'd produce something that would be uh, silted and um, static um, at least it would tend to be so what I do here is I as I give myself a ton of freedom play uh, with ideas here and uh, I'm just going to do my old iterative save Um, I, I you could also program if I wanted to um, into the express keys and iterative save etc so at this point uh, when I look at the image I've created so far um, I tell you what it reminds me of is is uh, in some funny way is the Turner's storm scenes it, it, it bear, on the face of it, it doesn't seem to bear any resemblance to the photo but actually if you half close your eyes I'm actually just painting tone and it's just lights and darks um, and uh, just working with tonal contrast and not undoing anything so another important aspect of what I'm sharing with you here is um, the power of commitment to process so um, I haven't rehearsed this I haven't worked on this image in fact I purposely picked an image I haven't yet worked on um, I pretty much like to be really fresh and excited by an image um, and not I don't like to sort of try to repeat something so this is absolutely fresh I don't know where this is going to go um, but I don't undo and you'll you'll notice that if whatever happens it happens in the in the serendipity the happy accidents you know they're all what make the richness of the canvas so if I started undoing I'd block my creative process I'd also be taking away the gift of serendipity for the painting and uh, and it's you know part of our challenge here with um, uh, painter and with working in the digital medium 
is that it's very easy to have uniformity and it's also very easy to have precision. So um, the longer you can play with um, imprecision and allow yourself to be in this uh, realm of, in a sense, chaos, um, although there is a lot of observation-based painting going on here, the, then uh, the more lively your painting is going to become. Let's look at maybe a different brush here. Um, I'm just going to have a look. So we've got the Sergeant Sharon's blend is good. It's big and bold. Um, and we've got finger painting. Uh, what's finger painting? Oh, let's just put a thumbprint here and there. Oh, actually, interesting. It sort of actually gives a nice doppled texture. Very interesting. It is actually made up of thumbprints, believe it or not. Um, and, uh, oh, I rather like that. Okay, stick a bit of that there. Modern art in a can, very good for flourishes. Um, this was uh, a brush that was, and this is in Jeremy, all these, uh, well, a lot of these are in Jeremy Box at 7, which is the latest um, of my uh, brush categories. And it comes with the latest workspace. Let's just have a look at color. And uh, let's pick something darker down here. So notice how frequently, um, ah, yeah, look at that. Ooh, let's just do a sort of um, something with a bit of blue feeling to it. And I'm just looking at the sort of shapes. And it's as if I just move my finger in the air. Like, what shapes are the two dancers there? Oh, they give that sort of feeling. What feeling does it, do they have? Um, you know, if I was moving my finger and creating like an energy field that represented what I see there, what would it be like? So um, that's enough of that. And let's uh, have a look here. Um, Impressionist, Mishmash Scumble. Oh, Mishmash Scumble. Jeremy Mishmash Scumble. Um, where? Ooh, maybe up here. Hmm. Jeremy. Yep. Oh yep. no, 10 minutes left. Yes. That means I got to, oh boy, I, I told you, Tanya, right? I totally lose track <laughs> of time. Um, and I really get into it. So part of what I like to do is, is really let the, this process you're seeing unfold here, um, go follow its own course for as long as possible. Now, I only have 10 minutes here in this webinar, so I'm not going to get to a completely finished stage of this, but I'm going to do my best to, to get somewhat along the way. Um, but what I encourage you to do is to not feel like you're in a rush to, to get that perfect masterpiece, finish it off, bring all the details in. And even if you're working for a client, and I think the, one of the biggest pressures with professional um, uh, portrait artists and uh, photographers who are using painter is there's this great concern. I, I, I got to make it look just like the photo, because they've got to please my client. They don't, they don't want to look abstract. They don't want to look too crazy. And what that can tend to do is limit the amount you play in your image. So I encourage you to play a lot. And like, this, is not, this is like a major part of what builds up the interest in the background. Um, and just think of the Nieto painting with the fancy dancer. Those wonderful backgrounds there. Um, and if you look at any of those Matisse's with great backgrounds, you see that as well. So I'm just going to bring in here, let's see, we've got eight minutes left. Is that right, Tanya? Eight minutes? Ooh, I'm going to have to really... Sorry, I was on mute. Really long, quick. <laughs> eight minutes left. Right, okay. And I want to allow a little bit of time for those questions. So. Um, we've got some questions. Have we uh, lined up? There are a few questions. Why don't you start just t telling me one at a time. I'm going to keep painting and uh, I'll try and address the questions as they come. And just a quick reminder to everybody, what you're seeing here has not involved any clone color at all yet. So it's all visual based. And, um, you know, one of the things that sometimes my students might say, you know, is like, well, I, you know, I'm not an artist as such. I haven't had formal art training, blah, blah, blah. I can't draw or whatever. And, and I think sometimes people uh, talk themselves out of allowing themselves the freedom to, to just go free, freehand, free form, and rely on observation. But actually, everybody can, what, what you see me do here is just observation, which everybody can do. And it is so fun when you just say, okay, I'm, I'm going to wait 
I'm going to not bring in clone color right away. I'm just going to have fun. And I encourage you all to do that. Anyway, so carry on. What's the first question? What size canvas are you working with? Excellent question. Excellent question. So let's have a look. First of all, let me do an iterative save. Ooh, there we go. And then let's go to canvas resize and have a look. So I've made this pretty small. Um, I just made it 3,000 by 2,000 pixels. And, you know, it says here 240. Let's put it into inches. And uh, let's make this 150 because I often print it around that. So this is a, right now it's really small, actually, 20 by 13. Um, but from this, I could later on make it bigger if I want. Um, but um, I would say in terms of advice on resolution, uh, obviously, some, to some extent, it depends on the computer you're using, and you don't want to have your brush strokes too slow. Um, the, uh, the other thing that you fact you want to bear in mind is that the brush size in Painter is, is related to pixels, and it's an absolute size. So if you have like a 10,000 by 6,000 pixel, a huge high-resolution image, you'll never get the sort of big brush strokes you're seeing me use here, because the maximum size here will, will still be small relative to the canvas. So you have to bear that in mind. So I would say maximum size, you know, if you're going to end up being like a 40 by 60 inch, you know, large piece, then you might want to work at 4,000 by 6,000 uh, pixels in Painter, but not really bigger than that. Now, if you're working on smaller stuff, then uh, 2,000 by 3,000 upwards is good. So anyway, that's the answer to the question. And let me dive in here for some little bit of um, more detail. And I'm just thinking of what brush. I'm going to use a small Sharon's Blender Wood. Sharon's Blender Wood normally is really good for big, uh, you know, for really, really covering big areas quickly. And let me just see what color I've got. Uh, do you want to fire another question, um, Tanya? Sure. A lot of people asked what the temporal color palette shortcut was, and I put it in. Oh, yeah. Question. So let me just show you. So whether you're on Mac or PC, what you're going to do to find it out, it's very easy. Um, you go on a Mac to pa Corel Painter Tour Preferences. On a PC, you go to Edit Preferences. And then on Mac or PC, you go down to Customize Keys. And then you go and customize keys to other. It is hidden. I mean, I have to admit, it, that's why I do this stuff. On Paintbox TV, I have uh, a, a whole set of, um, of manual settings for the Wacom Intuos 5 tablet, Express Keys, and Touch Ring, as well as Cintiqs. And um, so if you go, you know, it, so you can, that will help you if you're interested. But what you do is you go to Shortcuts Other, and you go all the way down to the bottom. And somewhere near the bottom, it is sitting there. There it is, Toggle Temple Color Palette. On a Mac, the default is Option Command 1. And on a PC, it will be Alt Control 1. So I hope that uh, helps there. That's very helpful. Here. OK, excellent. Any other uh, questions? Do you end up resizing your image afterwards, or do you just print as I think you mentioned at the size that you um, it, it all depends. Um, sometimes I do resize and um, just going in here. Again, I haven't yet used clone color because I haven't felt the need to yet. Um, I'm just looking at lights and darks. Ooh, there we go. Um, but you know, I, I'm, um, I'm pretty loose with my... Um, uh, resolution. So I print at like about 150. Sometimes I print higher, but um, typically I print about 150, and it works fine. You know, it seems to look look fine. And um, while I'm painting, I'm careful not to change resolution because then you get into real trouble if you are doing tracing paper. So, for instance, um, you know, you want to uh, look through at the original photograph, and I probably got the. There we go. Um, but the, um, where was I, Tango? I was talking about resolution, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, so I, d I do sometimes size up, but it wouldn't be till I finish painting. Um, let me just get a little bit of that sergeant, and we'll do some final detail. 
and so let's do an iterative save. I've got just a couple of minutes left. So okay, so ju just because I think it's important for everyone to see how does this all work. So I've now got a sergeant brush, and I'm going to let's first of all just pick a color that I feel like. So this color, pick up the highlight there. Um, and now I'm going to pick up a little bit of color for positioning for, from within the image. Um, to do that, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to bring this back and click on clone color. See that goes gray, the color wheel. Tab it away. I'm using the tab key all the time. I'm then on a Mac going option click. In the original image, that would be alt click. And you see that then um, I'm actually picking up uh, color from the source photo and the position is indicated by a crosshair. I should add one thing because uh, now and then you will need to know this. If you ever find that it's off register, then just make sure at that instance that you go on the cloning panel to normal where it's a zero and it'll be fine. So that just registers the positioning so that when you're working on a destination image, it's registering at the right point on the source image. Of course, this all uh, is predicated on the fact that they're the same pixel size exactly. So if you resize an image, um, it's very easy to accidentally um, to accidentally uh, go off register and you'll think, hey, how come the crosshair is in the wrong position? And so you just, you just have to watch out for that. Um, so I'm just going to do a little bit uh, here. And you'll notice, or uh, you may notice, that the color that's coming out here is dull. I mentioned that you know once you start putting lots of color into your um, painting without cloning, whenever you then go back to cloning, and I'm using a keyboard shortcut, which is also programmed in here to my tablet, um, Express Key, Option, Command on a Mac, Alt, Control on a PC. And when you choose that, it's a wonderful way to change brush size on the fly. So again, so you don't have to um, go back and um, go back and forth with all those palettes showing. Any other questions? We're almost at the end here, so I'll, I'll squeeze in another one or two. Sure. When you find an image that inspires you, and you feel that you just have to paint. Let's say that it's of um, the property that you were at in Santa Fe. Do you or how might you approach the, um, the business, the person, or whatnot as a prospective client? Do you do that? Do you then you know, offer your painting to them? Or do, do you? That's an excellent uh, point. That's a great suggestion. <laughs> um, so. Well, I can only uh, speak, um, you mean to, in terms of the owners of the property? Is that what you mean? Or? Yeah, for instance, I mean the, the paintings that you were doing in Santa Fe were mm. so beautiful. You even mentioned a restaurant that you recommended. Mm -hmm. Have you ever sent the artwork to them and in turn they may offer to pay for it or have you approached them to purchase? Well, I have to say that's a great idea and whoever suggested that, I better contact them after this webinar and give them a little <laughs> thanks. So um, next webinar I'll tell you the result. I, honestly, I'm so busy, Tanya. I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm keeping up with uh, doing all the videos on Paintbox TV and uh, I have various commissions on the go that I'm not as uh, probably as good at doing that as I should. So the answer is I, I don't, but I love the suggestion. And um, you know what? What I do though is I make sure, out of respect to my models, uh, and we always have model releases and everything all set up in advance. But out of respect, I always make sure that the models do get um, copies of uh, photos and uh, some, you know, copies of the artwork that results from, you know, their inspiration. So that I make sure it happens. Um, I think it's very, a great very idea. Good point. Yeah. And so uh, the other thing that I'm not too concerned about is getting detail everywhere. And you'll notice this quite clearly here that, um, uh, that I'm really, um, I'm, I'm not trying to jump in and grab all the detail right away. And it's just something that, you know, I encourage you, uh, 
to, again to think about when you're painting from photo because photos will tend to have you know so much in them um, and uh, it's interesting I just guess that position for that wall so there it is but I'm, I'm ignoring a ton of detail that was in the photo and that's fine by me because I really want the focus to be on the dancers and their relationship um, with the musicians so and and also uh, I'm going to be happy with it not being perfect. It's not perfect. I could keep working on this definitely for another few hours, and maybe I will, maybe I won't. I'm not sure yet. I haven't decided. Um, but uh, I'm just looking at small elements that may make a difference. There we go, that little light there, little light there. So I am working now with clone color, and then... Um, I think at that point, though, um, I should probably call it a day in terms of how far I'm going to take it in the webinar. And I'll do my little digital signature. Remember, it's 2013. I keep, I keep signing things as 2012. It always takes me a few weeks <laughs> to remember. Um, and do another iterative save. Say iterative save. So we have uh, reached the end of the webinar. And uh, that's as far as that's going to go for the webinar. Who knows what will happen. I'll probably post this on Paintbox TV. You know, if I continue working on it a bit, we'll see where it goes. But, well, that um, would be great. If you do any, I think it looks wonderful right now. And you always yeah. inspire me to loosen up because we know I have issues with that. Oh, you did beautiful work, Tanya. <laughs> and I, I just look forward to seeing more of it. I really encourage you. Well, I have a project that I need to complete right now, so I'm going to take some of these tips and Excellent. Excellent. bring them into <laughs> my work. But thank uh, you so oh. much. I, I think that we, for the most part, addressed all the questions during the webinar. There was one in regards of layers and masking and asking for tips on that, which I think... Yeah, um, so let me just say with regard to layers, you'll notice that the way I paint is very, is very visceral with the canvas. It's, I'm not, I don't, I mean, I do have layers when I use brushes which generate layers, um, and in collage I use layers all the time, but for a straight painting like this, I tend to actually like working on a flat canvas and blending things and mixing things, so I'm not a big layer person. Um, on Pinbox TV, there there are videos that address you know the techniques I use in layers and collage and working with layer masks. It's and it's it's actually for collage amazing and very powerful in paint up. Okay, terrific. So everyone, please go to PaintboxTV.com because you can see he has free resources and a wealth of information there if you would like to subscribe. And I highly recommend it. One thing for anybody who has questions about things coming up, um, uh, my workshops, etc. On Paintbox TV, there's an interactive calendar. And if you just look ahead, you'll see what's happening. I'm going to be in England uh, pretty much most of February giving a couple of talks and a little workshop. Um, and uh, then I've got my painter creativity uh, workshop like the one I showed you with a visit to the ballet studio at the end of April and then one at the end of July beginning of August and then in uh, September I'm doing a great Gatsby impressionist um, workshop which Tanya uh, came along to many years ago and uh, had a great time we go and uh, photograph uh, an amazing event with um, everyone dressing up like 1920s and Gatsby so um, <laughs> But anyway, it's really been a pleasure. Uh, thank you, Tanya. Thank you, everybody, uh, you know, for coming along, making time, and wishing you all a very, very happy and creative new year.